Live from Mountain View, California, it's The Q at OpenStack Silicon Valley, brought to you by headline sponsor, Mirantis. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, we're back, everyone. We're here live in Silicon Valley for theCUBE. This is our program, flagship program. We go out for the events and expect to see them the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Inc. I'm joined my co-host, Jeff Frick, who heads up our new CUBE Silicon Valley operation where we'll be going out to a ton of events, meetups, you name it. If it's good, we'll be there. If it's not, we won't be there. So that's a very simple, simple, uh, simple program. Uh, my co-host Jeff Frick, our next guest is Flo Liebert, founder and CEO of Mesosphere. Uh, Mesos is popular, you guys are rocking. I got people tweeting me right now, can't wait to hear the interview, so welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, we love to talk about Born in the Cloud. I know Lon had arranged to get, uh, get, you, get you on the program, we're glad to have you. Try to get you on a, a crowd chat we had with Evan Powell at Stackstorm. Um, just a bunch of geeks chatting, but really the issue is, is that the born in the cloud guys, the DevOps is now going mainstream. Certainly all the stuff about OpenStack is IT related. Yeah, some service provider, but it's basically want to be born in the cloud <laughs> with hybrid cloud. So all these issues come, at, come, come, to, the, come to bear because scale is, is a big issue right now. Scaling, reliability, having a developer environment that's robust, compatible with what developers want, which is infrastructure as code, in a complex environment. So I got to ask you um, what your take in is on all that and, and what you guys built and what your company's doing in that area, because certainly there's a lot of, quote, technical challenges under the hood. Of course, yeah, so um, the origin of our technology was really at UC Berkeley, where it was um, co-authored by Benjamin Hintman. And uh, what we did is we were running into massive scaling issues back at Twitter when I worked there first, uh, and that was roughly, beginning of 2010, and uh, the site was, like many sites, a monolithic application. It, that means it was, in the case of Twitter actually, it was, a, it was a Rails application. It was powered by a MySQL database and had some memcached uh, servers that were, well, used as caches. <laughs> and um, what, what Twitter needed to do at that time in order to scale up the infrastructure was turn a lot of the functionality into microservices. So for example, the first thing that you generally pull out, I think in sites like this, is search. Uh, search contains a lot of logic and um, usually uh, it's pretty latency sensitive. So um, search was pulled out and a bunch of other components were pulled out into these microservices. And we needed a way to uh, easily deploy these microservices uh, as they were being built. But also, uh, the problem was when you had a microservice, it, it didn't necessarily take up the entire resources that were offered by one big server. So what we wanted to do is figure out a way to bin pack, to automatically bin pack a lot of these microservices onto uh, these big servers. And um, we looked over to UC Berkeley where, where uh, Benjamin Hintman was working on Mesos, brought him in for a talk and all the folks at Google, uh, that, that were previously at Google that had joined Twitter, saw some similarities in the technology that they were using at, um, at Google, and it was called Borg back in the day, later became Omega, and they saw the similarity in it and, and uh, saw that this can really solve a lot of these problems. The deployment problem, but also the orchestration problem, of course, and also um, increased utilization by two to three X. So this is, the big, this is the big discussion everyone has that may not be inside the industry. All these large scale, web scale companies are essentially building out while they're scaling. So, you know, we, we even know the early days of Twitter, we even know Zynga, they all started on Amazon. Yeah. You know, they bootstrap, they get capital efficient, and then boom, they're scaling, and there's a kind of a diminishing return where they got to set up their own gear, yeah. stand up their own infrastructure, and then it's a huge challenge because the applications are putting load on the system, and the app guys are buy more gear, buy more gear, provision this. Yeah. So that's your experience, right? You've had this. Talk about the pain and how you guys looked at that, and then where you are today. So yeah, um, one of the things we saw was that you could page every night, specifically at Airbnb, uh, we were built on top of Amazon, and on Amazon, uh, the, the platform is not necessarily as reliable as when you have your own hardware, because Amazon might just turn off one of your servers overnight. So if you're, if you're a DevOps or an SRE, you get paged, and then you have to deal with it. And uh, 
that was one of the big things that we actually wanted to fix. And that's why we started to build Mesosphere. We wanted to automate a lot of these tasks that, are, that have to be done in your data center completely away for you. At the same time, we wanted to increase resource uh, utilization. So uh, th one of the first projects we built at Mesosphere was called, or is called Marathon. And it's a way to orchestrate containers at scale. So you can go in and you can say, I want, I want to launch a Rails application that depends on maybe a memcached server. And you can deploy this application topology and then just scale it up. And in fact, it's really easy to actually auto, use auto scaling by hooking into our REST APIs and then just increasing the number of Rails instances, memcached servers, and so forth. So let's unpack this nuance about horizontally scalable. That is the beautiful thing about the cloud and Amazon. It's horizontally scalable. Yeah. As demand comes in, there's all kinds of tools. You just horizontally scale, load comes in, boom, it's done, it feels good, it's easy to do. Almost like pushing a button, I'm oversimplifying, versus standing up gear, yep. which requires a lot of configuration management, policy-based everything, orchestration, integration, automation, which is a real pain in the ass. Right? Yep. Straight up, right? So Okay, so now we're in this horizontally scalable world. What are the table stakes for someone out there who's saying, hey, you know what? I want horizontally scalable. I want an app environment that at will I could program infrastructure. What do they do? Give us, give us the playbook. Well, I think the first thing you generally do is you figure out how you package your application. And uh, through the advent of Docker, the Docker file format, uh, we now have a really good way of packaging an application up. And um, Google has actually put a lot of effort into Isolation. So in 2007, 2008, isolation came into the came into the Linux kernel, uh, and Google <laughs> contributed heavily. And uh, that isolation can now be used in order to run these applications next to each other on the same box. And that's based, by the way, one of the one of the key feet one of the key features that we uh, take advantage of in Mesos and Marathon. Uh, when when we want to scale up your application, we can scale it on the same box, but we can also scale it across numerous uh, servers. Talk about the scaling containers at scale. <laughs> it sounds kind of a mouthful, but what does that mean? Docker's hot right now because it really is a nice framework. Certainly the developers adopted it, and it's, they really cracked the code on open, how to use open source in a way that actually punishes you for not being open. <laughs> right? Talk about that dynamic. Yeah, so I, I think Docker is, Docker is great. I mean, they've really, they've really uh, invented a great file format. But I think there's much more to it. If you want to run a, if you want to run a large data, scale, da data center at scale, you need to orchestrate. And uh, orchestration is something that's actually really difficult to do. It took, it took Google years uh, of, of hardcore development to get to a point where they could scale up to thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands of servers. And Twitter, likewise, it took them, it took them a lot of, a lot of time and uh, engineering effort to get to a point where Mesos was as stable as it is today, where you can actually go in and provision and then run on a 10,000 node cluster. So I got to ask you the question, obviously looking at your investor list, Andreessen Horowitz, the list goes on and on, very disruptive investors, they like to go after the disruptors. Uh, you are being a disruptor, who are you disrupting? Uh, and who's it disrupted by you guys? So I, I think, I think uh, that's, that's a great question to ask. So um, I think to a certain extent right now, the the whole virtualization space is being disrupted. And I think it's being disrupted in a way that in the past we always thought about bin packing onto a single server multiple applications. And back in the day, 10 years, 15 years back, in the, in the height of the client server era, uh, the applications were relatively small and the servers kept increasing in capacity. At most you had a, maybe, a, maybe an Oracle server with a slave, uh, with a slave instance, and um, they, they it spanned one server and, and the, the, the slave server was also one big server. But oftentimes you had a couple of Apache web servers and so forth on the same box. And there we used um, virtual machines in order to manually bin pack the server to increase, uh, to increase utilization. And uh, what, what we are seeing now is applications today are from day one distributed systems. They no longer live on just one box. They are, example for that are Hadoop, Spark, uh, Storm and Cassandra and MongoDB and many more. They run on multiple servers from day one and in that world we actually need a different model. We think we need an aggregation model, not a virtualization model. And you could think of it as we are virtualizing the entire data center to make it look like one big computer. And what yeah, we're in the business... That's the mega trend right now. It's not to yeah. be siloed into a box. Uh, 
And we want to build the operating system that runs on your, on your entire data center. Okay, so where are you with that? So, so where are you in the step? I mean, that's a, a lofty dream, yeah. great goal to have. Make it look like one monolithic resource, but there's a lot of stuff moving around with the distributed computing architecture. So large scale computer science is at play here. What, what's under the hood? I mean, what is, what is the key secret sauce? So really the key secret sauce I think is, uh, is Mesos for us. So Apache Mesos is, is a project that has that has really figured out how to uh, represent resources that each of the nodes that each of the nodes provides and hand them up to the applications. And then as an application developer, you can actually go in and say, I'm programming against resources rather than against individual machines. And I think that's really powerful. And those resources can shift and go where, there, where there's more opportunities for capacity, et cetera. Exactly. And uh, you, you can, on a, on a global level, decide a policy, which applications should get how many resources. So that makes for really interesting, uh, interesting dynamics in your data center. This is the trend we were talking about at VMworld, Jeff, the dictating the policy to the infrastructures, the applications, versus the other way around. This is, was not the way it was when I was growing up in the business. You stack a bunch of gear and they were limited by the engines that you had. That's a completely different shift. Yep. Um, so I got to ask you a question for the folks out there who are learning about you guys. Certainly the buzz is, the buzz is good. You guys have a great, great uh, track record and team. Um, what are you and what aren't you? So if you had to put a, you know, a statement out there, this is what we are, we're more like, we're the Uber of this, not the say no, I'm just <laughs> kidding, that's just an inside joke, Silicon, Angle, Silicon Valley. So, um, but what are you and what aren't you? We're the operating system for the data center. And um, what, what are we not? Well, everything else. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 not, we're not a big data company. Let's just say you're the Uber for the data center. Just, just go with that, because that'll <laughs> definitely get your next round done. Um, well, yeah. You've got to be the Uber of something these days. <laughs> No, no, we're, we're not. Oh, okay. yeah, we're, not we're not really in the data <laughs> uh, in, in the big data space. We're uh, we're really in the infrastructure space, and uh, so we are we're an infrastructure company. Yeah. So Flo, you've got a lot of history with kind of born in the cloud applications yeah. and really big single applications that scale really big with Twitter, and Airbnb. As you talk to enterprises, talk about the challenges that they have, where it's really a many you know trying to apply these principles across many applications. In the, day, in the same data center, as well as when they've got applications that weren't necessarily built this way from the, from the ground up to really be able to assign yeah. resources as a service versus how they were pretty much rigidly signed. Are people trying to convert those? You know, can, they, can they leverage some of these lessons learned in that environment? So, so, so that's really the beautiful thing about a marathon which we've written. It sort of acts like a shim between your existing applications, which you don't have to modify, that run on Linux today, that you can run on Amazon today, uh, and the Mesos system. So we've written, we've written Marathon specifically for that purpose. You can take any existing Linux application today, deploy it at scale, and actually get self-healing and higher resource utilization as a nice side effect. Wow, so you can apply it, you can apply it to your legacy stuff. Oh, absolutely, so, yes. So VMware hopes to be the operating system of the data center. Software-defined data center is the hot buzzword. I mean, that's in essence what you're saying. Is that correct? I'm, I'm sure there, always, there can always be a lot of players in a big space. So. <laughs> okay, so you're disrupting who again? VMware, IBM, <laughs> HP, are they friends, foe, frenemy? I think we're fi really filling a void. I they are, you are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> They're voided, so they, you know. No, but this is the big thing here, OpenStack is really about IT. So how do you come into the IT world, have a little bit different requirements? They're born on premise, yeah. they're not born in the cloud, but they want to be born in the cloud in a halfway what, basis, like a hybrid. So, so actually I think um, we play really nice with OpenStack. So a lot of our customers actually have started to invest heavily into OpenStack and it's really great for provisioning. So if you want the Amazon-like provisioning in, in your data center and you have already invested in OpenStack, you can just run Mesos on top of it. And then you get additional automation uh, on top of your already highly automated data center. Now, that being said, there are companies that that are starting with greenfield projects, and like Twitter, for example, right? When it when it decided to move uh, down this path of, of uh, having everything run via Mesos, decided to not use any other technology, and they're just using Linux C groups, so barebound containers, alongside Mesos and uh, some of their frameworks that they've written on top of Mesos directly. 
So talk about OpenStack. What do they need to do better? Obviously orchestration is a conversation that we have every time we go to an OpenStack show. It's kind of higher up the stack, but there's still some critical issues. Automation, again, is another buzzword. But they seem to be stuck in the building block mode. What is happening from your perspective in the OpenStack community? They're, I mean, it's evolutionary, so it's not, they're not taking a step back, but they, they're, they're, some say they're not moving fast enough to provide that basic substrate infrastructure. Well, I think, I think OpenStack uh, has, set a, has set a really high goal also for themselves, so um, I think it's, it's a tough problem. And uh, even just solving the provisioning piece, I think, takes a, lot of, takes a lot of time. And I think they've done a great job on that, so uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what comes next. Okay, so we have a, a question from uh, Stu Miniman, who's watching from uh, Wikibon, he's a big fan of yours. I can see him geeking out right now at his terminal. Uh, he asks, uh, can Flow explain how Mesos interacts with Docker and Kubernetes? Of course. So um, Kubernetes is a project uh, um, built by Google, and it was supposed to mimic some of the uh, workflows, some of the developer workflows that Google has in order to roll out the applications. And uh, we went in and uh, decided to uh, partner with Google in order to bring Kubernetes uh, on top of Mesos so that it can scale, so that it can, can scale massively. Because one of the pieces that Google has not open sourced that they are running internally is called Omega, and was previously known as Borg, and that is not available for everybody. So uh, that, that was a great opportunity to, for us to say, hey, we're going to integrate the two projects and give uh, Kubernetes fans the ability to run at massive scale. So are you a vitamin or an aspirin to Kubernetes? <laughs> <laughs> we're by, well, we're both. <laughs> You're a vaccine, right? <laughs> no, That's I mean, <laughs> no, we, we're really a vitamin. We, we really coexist, coexist uh, nicely with them. And, and, and they're growing, too. Yes, I mean, exactly. That's a big part of their thing. Now, um, now, now for Docker, um, to, to answer the second part of your question, so, so again, I think Docker has done a great job figuring out how to package an application with a Docker file format. And, but but if, you, if you just have a Docker container, you can't do really that much with it, right? So that's where we come in, and we've uh, figure out a way how to orchestrate it at scale. And not just for 10 nodes, not just for 100 nodes, but for thousands and tens of thousands of nodes. Okay, so I want you to kind of kind of put your messaging aside and put your like a visionary hat on and your geek hat on and paint a picture of what the data center looks like five to 10 years from now. CIOs, what's the preferred future look like for you as the founder and CEO of Mesosphere? You know, for the ideal future, what is it going to look like in the data center? So, I think there will be far fewer vendors who sell into the data center. I think it's going to consolidate quite a bit. I think They'll have a hard time with that. They'll be clutching and grabbing to the last minute. Yeah, I, th I think also more and more commodity components will make their way into the data center. So I think, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of chips that we're seeing in cell phones today, ARM and Atom processors moving into the data center because they're just more, uh, they're just more power efficient and you can have many more processors uh, in your data center that way. I think power virtualization is going to be a big aspect. I think uh, right now, the, the racks that you're seeing, every node has, a, has its own power supply. I don't think that's actually, uh, that's the future. I think we'll see, uh, we'll see a different rack format where we can just swap out, uh, where we can just swap out disks that are, by, by the way, no longer spinning, that are all flash-based, uh, and RAM and CPUs that are really small. So what about the role of data? Obviously, Internet of Things is big. Um... Is this going to be just our native, native, native part of the infrastructure? Yeah, so, so I think I, I, I have to actually speak uh, on behalf of Mesos here again. So I think specifically with the Internet of Things and uh, the need for more data processing applications as, as that need arises, we will see more frameworks being built directly against the data center. And that's where Mesos really comes in and can help you. Because Spark, are you familiar with Spark? Yes, very much so, so yeah. So, so Spark was one application that was built against the Mesos API initially, and that's how they were able to move so quickly. Now, when they first started Spark, there was no Mesosphere, and there were no Mesos RPMs and Debian packages. So when you wanted to run Spark, you also had to compile Mesos from scratch. And uh, that's why they had to backfill a lot, of the, a lot of the networking that Mesos gives you for free. A lot of the messaging, the RPC, the isolation, uh, they had to backfill that, and uh, what I think is like we're, we're not at the end of the we're not at the end of the tunnel of uh, data frameworks, data processing frameworks. There will be many more. Flo, thanks for coming on the cube. The founder and CEO of Mesosphere. Uh, innovation is uh, happening. These guys are doing well. Keep an eye on these guys. Certainly, uh, as the evolution of the stack continues. Congratulations. The data center is software defined. It's happening. 
And we're here at the OpenStack Silicon Valley. We'll be right back after this short break.